This is next level hating. Despite the Boston Celtics going up 2-0 in the NBA Finals, the only narrative that everybody seems to be talking about is how Jason Tatum isn't performing and how Jalen Brown is outperforming and being the best player. But in my opinion, that should not matter at all. This Celtics team is two wins away from an NBA championship with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown solidifying that sticking together and working through this hard road will pay off. We're going to be diving, looking at how crazy and how blasphemous this narrative is and how it must stop because everybody is hating on this team. All of that and more on this episode of Celtics Digest. I'm Bruce Velez. Before we dive in, before we get into all this, if you do enjoy the content, hit that like button. But let's dive in. Let's get into the news at hand today. Like I mentioned in the introduction, this narrative must stop. This narrative must end. It is getting out of hand. It is getting way too ridiculous. First off, starting in this playoffs, I know Jason Tatum hasn't been playing the best as a scorer for this team. But as we've seen with this Celtic squad in the past, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown being these 30, 40 point per game scorers is not what the Celtics need every single night. In past series, in playoffs, they've been needed to do that. And when they don't perform, the role players don't come through. This team needed some cohesion. It needed some better standout stars. And by getting got rid of guys like Grant Williams, Robert Williams, Malcolm Brogdon, and Marcus Smart, they were able to bring in two key players in Drew Holiday and Kristaps Porzingis, who have been key to the integral success for the Celtics in the regular season, but also in this playoffs. Drew Holiday, again last night, was dominant in scoring with the help of alongside of Jason Tatum, and we'll get into that as well. And Kristaps has been very effective as well. But as you guys know, this video is kind of talking about the hate and talking about all the despair that we've seen. So kind of diving in, let's look at this image, obviously from Stat Mamba, which goes to show you Jason Tatum in the 24 finals, shooting 17, averaging 17 points per game on 19 field goal attempts and shooting around 32% from the field. This would mark the lowest field goal percentage by any All-NBA First Team player in the finals since 1960. And if we want to look at this tweet as well, we can see the comparison with him compared to guys like Patrick Ewing, J.R. Smith, Kevin Love, Sam Perkins, Jason Kidd. He has the lowest out of all of them. And this tweet says, Jason Tatum is hands down the most overrated player in the NBA Finals the last five years. Absolutely carried by his team. Well, to say to Up in the Hill Sports, you, sir, aren't watching the games. Because, if you forget, let's look at this picture from Game 1. And not also remember the fact that in Game 2 that this also was happening. Look at Jason Tatum with the ball in his hands. He has not one, not two, not three, but all the five of the Dallas Mavericks defenders looking straight at him. You can see Jalen Brown open in the corner, see Hauser open on the wing, on the elbow. Look, he even drew on the opposite corner, wide open. Chris stops waving his hand going, hey, JT, look for me. I'm wide open. Give me the ball. This is the things that have led to the Celtics success. Jason Tatum driving, kicking out, playing five out, allowing the Mavericks basically to have to switch, have to come up, have to prioritize these defenders. And even guys like Hauser hit shots from Drew Holiday hit shots to Jalen Brown. So it's not like anybody in the Mavericks can slack off or let anybody take any opportunities. They did that similarly in game one and Al Horford was 50% from the field from three point range. You can't realistically let that happen. And that's how the Mavericks have gotten by in this playoffs. Teams like the Thunder and teams like the Timberwolves have allowed their guys to get wide open threes and the Celtics are not allowing them to do that. And that's why their role players are missing a bunch of these opportunities. Honestly though, as we all know, Jason Tatum, like we mentioned, hasn't been playing the greatest in the scoring aspect, but let's look at him on the other aspects. Like we mentioned, he's almost averaging a triple-double in the NBA Finals, and people are saying he's playing awful. 17 points, 10 rebounds, 8.5 assists in two of those games. And once again, like I mentioned, Jason Tatum is playing this facilitator role, playing this setup for the offense, getting guys like Drew Holiday, getting guys like Jalen Brown involved. Drew Holiday, yes, was the leading scorer with 26 points in that Celtics Game 2 victory, but a, mu a majority of those shots are led by Jason Tatum driving to the rack like this, having two or three guys collapsing, and that's allowing for Drew Holiday, who's underneath the basket, to make the reverse layup or make, you know, the baseline hook shot or to get that offensive or defensive rebound or for Jason Tatum to drive and have that big man collapse. So he just swings a pass right around Daniel Gafford and Drew Holiday's looking right underneath the basket with just a free cookie layup. Those are the opportunities that allow Drew Holiday to score. And let's not forget that to end the first half, the Celtics to take that lead, get that three-point lead, scored off of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum both 
driving and kicking back out to that which led to a Drew Holiday wide open corner three-pointer that the Mavericks didn't come and hop out on and, and jump. Those plays are created by Jason Tatum. Those offensive pressures are created by Jason Tatum. And without that effect of Jason Tatum having that pressure, Jason Tatum would just be driving to the rack. If Jason Tatum doesn't have two, three, four guys going on him, he's going to the rack. He's going for these layups. He's trying to score on two or three guys. And yes, he might get have more fouls and have more shot percentage, but he's playing more selfish basketball. I'm loving what I'm seeing. This team is built off of team chemistry, and that's what they're playing too. Yes, Jalen Brown has been successful, and this is not to knock Jalen Brown as well because I've been a huge Jalen Brown supporter this entire year, this entire series, and he was deserving of that Eastern Conference Finals MVP. He really stepped up and played up to par in that series alongside Jason Tatum. But let's not knock Jalen, Jason Tatum or knock Jalen Brown when we're comparing the other. Like Drew Holiday said when we look at this quote, when looking at both of those teams, he doesn't prefer one or the other. He prefers both. And I am in the same boat as our boy, Drew Holiday. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, they are the two best wings or two-way wings in the entire NBA. And Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, yes, they may excel in one other aspect. Jalen Brown in attacking at and scoring at the rim and being aggressive, while Jason Tatum is a better, you know, mid-range shooter and three-point scorer. Both players can do their intangible opposites. Jalen Brown can score from the three-point range, can score from the mid-range, and have, you know, a beautiful fading mid-range turnaround jumper. While Jason Tatum can also be aggressive, be fantastic on the defensive side, and still go to the basket and get those and-one slams and be that physical beast. They just kind of, you know, when one player is playing bad in that other aspect, the other really kind of takes over. If Jalen Brown's going to be that aggressive scorer, Jason Tatum will be that commanding rebounder and that commanding facilitator and vice versa. Similarly, with Derek White and Drew Holiday as well, they kind of have that role in between the point guard, which one's going to be the facilitator and the setter up on offense, while the other is going to be, you know, that defensive freak of nature and getting all those key blocks to basically win the game. And we saw that last night with Derek and Holiday, with Holiday being that prime offen offensive guy, while Derek was that prime defensive guy. And, and speaking of people, you know, kind of chiming in and kind of giving their word, we want to look at this tweet from Celtics Unite, which kind of harps on what I've been saying, which is Shaq being 100% real, saying, don't get fixated on the useless rankings, just get the job done, and saying that every, they're, they're trying to separate you and JT by saying one's better, and that it does not matter. With JB being, you know, humble, being, you know, a basketball first guy, he truly understands. He realizes this by saying, yes, sir, I understand, and yes, sir, I agree, which I love to see coming out of JB, really recognizing, don't take these narratives, don't take these comparisons, just go out there, win this championship, and prove everybody wrong. Let's not forget that there were people that were coming out and saying, trade Jalen Brown for Ben Simmons, trade Jalen Brown for Donovan Mitchell, trade Jalen Brown for Kevin Durant, trade him for Bradley Beal. Those were all not worth it. Jalen Brown was a young, experiencing, two-way wing who has been blossoming into one of the best, if not the best, two-way wing in, in the entire NBA, snubbed of all defensive team, snubbed of an all-NBA team, and is proving the haters wrong once again. Let me know how you guys feel down below in the comment section. What are your guys' kind of takes on all this hate, on all this outlandish stuff? I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think the national media is going to come to life if the Boston Celtics get this done. And let's not forget, they are two games away from winning a championship, and this is what they want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the excellence or the success or this is fantastic for the city. No, they just want to pick the narrative. Oh, Jason Tatum's playing bad. The Celtics are undefeated when he shoots under 40%. Be quiet with that. We are winning this championship as a team. That's the narrative that we are pushing for, and it is the goal that we are striving for, and it's all that matters. Before we head out, though, we do have a little bit of a mini Chris Dops Porzingis injury update, and you might have already kind of saw it earlier on if you guys were keeping your eyes peeled. But Chris Dops, you know, did uh, tweak his calf in Game 4. Joe said he's going to be good. But Jared Weiss had this quote from Kristaps Porzingis saying he's going to go on, on Game 3 and saying that he legitimately will die out there on the court. Obviously, uh, KP looking to get revenge versus Dallas going back to his home you know, team, playing them in the finals. He definitely is going to want to be able to play versus them. But getting that rest towards the end of the game definitely could have relieved some stuff. Joe said he'll be okay. KP said he's going to be okay. And I truly think that rest leading up to the finals has prepared Kristaps Porzingis for any, you know, mishap or misdirection that kind of come in these last couple of games. And that's ultimately why I think he'll be ready to go into game three and into game four and throughout the rest of this series. We'll have to see how long the series goes. Once again, drop down your comments down below. Let me know what you guys think down below so you guys can be pictured 
or featured for comment of the day. Today's comment of the day goes to Drama Reloaded, one of our big supporters on here on Celtics Digest. I want to give a shout out to you for supporting us hitting 4,000 subscribers. But you mentioned that two games away the Boston Celtics are, and I know, it's crazy. It's kind of crazy to think that the Boston Celtics team, the team that we've been watching all season, the team that we've had these hopes, the teams that we've been hoping these dreams, aspirations, is just two games away, ladies and gentlemen, from being NBA champions. I don't know how I'm going to react. I don't know how I'm going to feel. It's kind of already... Uh, very uh, goosebumpy, and I'm not even on the team, but I, you know what I mean? Like, I just kind of just, like, thinking about it already and just like, wow, I can't wait to see how this is going to be if they come through. But, again, job's not finished. Job's not done. We have seen with this Mavericks team them come back down series versus the Suns. We've also seen with Drew Holiday in the finals versus the Suns come back down 2-0. So we can't get comfortable. Can't Got to stay focused. Got to stay locked in. Got to go to Dallas, split the series at least, and come back to Boston trying to win that game five at home, get the championship for your home crowd. Let me know how you guys think. Let me know what you guys think about this video, how you guys are feeling about this Celtics team. If you enjoyed the content, you enjoyed what you see, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, check out the other videos linked up at the top, and come check us on Wednesday and Friday for live watch longs breaking down game three and game four of the NBA Finals. Once again, I'm Bruce Velez. I want to say thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and go Boston Celtics.